Okay. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can hear. It's George Hathaway here, uh, up, way up in uh, Toronto or near Toronto. Um, I'm uh, an experimentalist, so uh, uh, most of the the uh, activity uh, around here is uh, things and, and devices and knobs and switches and stuff. Uh, so um, the uh, the meat of what I'd like to to uh, talk about uh, happens to uh, dwell on those kinds of things rather than uh, um, equations and uh, and and um, things that are neatly able to be put on a screen. Uh, so what I'm proposing to do is uh, discuss briefly what uh, uh, was uh, required in this uh, recent uh, calibration effort um, uh, for um, uh, for Jim's uh, uh, calibrator. And, but before that, um, I'd like to discuss briefly to continue uh, from the uh, pick up from uh, what Lance was talking about. And um, Lance, as, uh, as uh, you've just uh, heard, has come up with a, a, a testable theory. And uh, I was asked to uh, determine whether it would be possible to, um, de to put together an experiment uh, where the charge on a particular object uh, could be made rather large, just to make sure that uh, um, the previous experiments, which I'll describe momentarily, uh, were not seeing a subtle effect that uh, uh, that was predicted by Lance, but uh, perhaps the coupling coefficient uh, was different, uh, as he described. So. Um, the previous set of experiments, uh, there have been quite a few uh, with regard to looking at the weight change of a charged body. Um, and he mentioned uh, Martin, uh, I believe he mentioned Martin Tymar and myself. And uh, the thing to realize with uh, Lance's, uh, Lance's uh, uh, discovery is that the, the force is supposed to be in the vertical direction, uh, not sideways. Um, for instance, if you think, well, gee, I remember a guy named uh, um, uh, Brown, wasn't his name Brown? And he did an experiment where he had very high charges on a, on a dielectric material and he looked at them on a pendulum perhaps and he looked at them moving on a torsion balance um, and uh, this, we've, we had done this experiment as well uh, several decades ago, back to, uh, uh, and up to about 30 kV in oil and taking all the precautions, um, as many as we could with regard to uh, removing uh, artifact and uh, saw no, uh, no evidence of force um, in, in the, the Biefeld Brown uh, which was, of course, essentially going this way. I don't recall them ever testing it in the vertical dimension. However, um, uh, recently uh, Martin Tymar and group in uh, Dresden have made a rather exhaustive um, e examination of um, the Neo Biefeld uh, experiments with various geometries and various uh, kinds of devices charged to, uh, I think uh, 20 kV was his, uh, top, um, his, his top charge voltage. And uh, he uh, did a, a, a really good job of, of uh, trying to isolate these high voltage uh, systems from artifacts and from uh, influences that could uh, cause spurious readings. Uh, and he came to the conclusion that no, there was no, um, there was no relationship between the charge on a body and a, an associated gravitational or force. And he looked at all sorts of, ori well, as many orientations as you can think of um, with his devices, including vertical. So he came to the conclusion that, uh, gee, it uh, doesn't look like there's uh, uh, the kind of uh, result that Lance 
had been uh, had been predicting. Uh, Lance's predictions are really I agree with his description of Kaluza uh, uh, kilotons uh, because he was predicting char uh, uh, forces in this direction on uh, charged bodies where the charges, uh, for instance, uh, resulting from voltages in the kilovolt range, uh, would be in the in in um, uh, you know pounds of thrust, you might say, um, easily measurable by uh, by uh, the, the the most uh, unsophisticated uh, kinds of uh, experimental apparatus. Well. Um, uh, Lance asked me to uh, examine uh, situations where the charges are on objects would be much greater uh, than what uh, uh, than what Martin had uh, been uh, working with, just in case for some reason there might have been a threshold uh, or a nonlinearity uh, that. Uh, might indicate that uh, there would be a uh, you know, s something magical would happen. Kilotons would, uh, would appear uh, once you got over, I don't know, maybe 50 kV or something like that, or 43 kV, whatever it was. So um, he asked me to consider a, uh, a, a higher voltage experiment, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, or which we uh, were able to put together anyway, it's still in process. And uh, so what, what, we've, uh, what we've done, and uh, uh, if I can show uh, uh, people if they're interested, some of the material uh, and the apparatus that we've uh, put together um, to carry out this experiment. And uh, the primary uh, uh, source of charge, uh, well, there, there are two primary sources of charge. One is a, um, a Glassman uh, 150 kV DC, uh, both polarity uh, test, uh, where we are charging a, uh, 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 we're going to be charging two spheres or spheroids. One is about uh, 18 inches in diameter and the other is a, um, a meter in diameter, and uh, I can show you those uh, if you wish. I can walk out to the lab. That's why I've got this other computer, and I don't have the one that has the uh, the uh, uh, the Woodward report. However, um, so to so the the Glassman would get us to 150. Will get us to 150 kV, uh, both polarities. And I also have uh, two Van de Graaff machines uh, that uh, were made a long time ago for uh, looking at the, uh, the Podkletnov uh, gravity beam experiment, if anyone remembers that, uh, where we did not find a, uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, results that Podkletnov had claimed. Uh, and uh, this, these are two, uh, high voltage uh, devices, uh, electrostatic machines that are uh, um, calculated or theoretically able to uh, produce um, um, probably uh, close to 900 kV each, uh, but practically because they're not perfectly spheroidal, uh, they're not uh, operating in a vacuum, uh, they have little imperfections on the surface, etc. They can climb to probably uh, five, six hundred kV. And uh, I have two of them. One is uh, uh, one of them is uh, positive, and the other is negative. So, uh, with those uh, pieces of apparatus, uh, I, I started to consider that we could do uh, the uh, kinds of tests that. Uh, Lance is is interested in up to uh, a couple hundred kV, and uh, so uh, that that's all very nice. But uh, one of the concerns is that uh, uh, the um, uh, electrostatic machines, which are uh, uh, Van de Graaff machines, have uh, produced very high voltages, 
but at microamps of current. So how do you uh, make sure that uh, you are measuring a, uh, the, the, the voltage and thus the charge on these, these machines um, when you have such a low current? Typically, a, a device that can calibrate uh, a, a high voltage machine, such as in high voltage engineering, in power systems, um, uses uh, a particular kind of voltage divider that uh, has a uh, uh, fairly robust uh, front end in terms of uh, its, its impedance uh, or resistance in case of a DC machine. Um, in the case of the Van de Graaff machine, uh, the, uh, the problem is this low current. So I had to uh, uh, make a uh, special uh, voltage divider for the Van de Graaff machines that was a very high impedance front end uh, so that I would not drain the, uh, the very tiny currents produced by the Van de Graaff machine and still have uh, an accurate reading uh, of, of voltage. So uh, that has been put together. Um, the, the final aspect is how to measure these uh, forces that, uh, according to Lance, are, uh, are rather um, uh, going to be rather large, but in my estimation from the work I've done in the past, likely to be very small. So uh, we had to design a, um, and have designed a, uh, uh, a load cell that is capable of, uh, of for instance, looking at uh, about 0.04% um, of uh, weight change. Uh, but the other thing to realize is that uh, when we're dealing with two, 300 kilovolts um, in uh, any kind of, uh, of, of laboratory setting, uh, everything gets charged. Uh, and that includes the measuring apparatus, <laughs> like the load cells. So we had have to take special precautions to um, isolate the load cell uh, and uh, make sure that the um, uh, that the electrostatic charge that builds up on all these surfaces does not screw up the the, the readings. Uh, those are just a, a couple of the uh, issues uh, that need to be addressed. Um, the other uh, others are uh, the humidity of the room and uh, the, you know, which will bleed off charge and uh, uh, concerns about um, how uh, the charge might uh, sneak up the, the uh, support structures. So if you wish, I can, uh, I can walk out to the lab and show you the size and scale of some of these things, uh, if that would be useful. Uh, Hal, is that acceptable in this case? I think that will work, yes. We would love to see that. I can stop the share. And, yeah, you can uh, stop the share, and, and I will, I'll take this computer. How do you speak of you, everyone? And then you'll see George in, in big. Yeah, okay. So I'm uh, heading out into the lab now, um, and uh, we'll show uh, just the scale of some of the things that are required to uh, do the kinds of tests that uh, Lance is hoping for. Uh, with uh, regard to uh, charges uh, resulting from voltages up to two, 300 kV. So uh, here we are in the back, uh, the high bay, uh, and above me you can see uh, the one meter diameter sphere. By the way, the ceiling is 16 feet above the floor. Uh, that is a uh, polished aluminum sphere of uh, one meter diameter. It is used typically uh, along with this sphere, which is uh, 75 centimeters in diameter, to uh, measure high voltages using uh, uh, calibrated uh, arc discharge length between the two. Uh, in fact, uh, we're not using it for that purpose. Uh, we will be using the suspended sphere uh, as one of the charged objects in Lance's experiment. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, um, 
shape is part of a uh, Van de Graaff machine you a little that uh, is going to be suspended as well from a protected uh, device up there on the ceiling, which is the, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but the, uh, there's the force gauge. So the force gauge will have a cord that drops down and suspends these two shapes. Okay, how do you charge them? Well, they're going to be charged from, uh, as I say, uh, a, uh, a Glassman, which is a commercial uh, device uh, up to 150 kV, but uh, above that up to uh, 300 kV or so uh, are these uh, twin Van de Graaff machines. You can see how tall they are, which were used uh, in the uh, Podkletnov experiment some time ago. One is positive, one is negative, and they they will be attached to the suspended masses or weights uh, by a flexible, uh, a flexible conductor so that the, the, um, the weight can be measured by the, the force gauge or uh, the load cell way up there. But how do you measure the charge on these Van de Graaff spheres accurately. It's really difficult since they're such small current devices. Well, I had to construct a special uh, voltage divider, which is this one, for the purpose. And it has, it's oil filled and uh, has a series of uh, uh, very high value uh, half gig ohm resistors. And that will, uh, well, that will be the voltage divider with which we will measure the voltage on these uh, Van de Graaff machines, as well as uh, calibrate or, uh, the, the, uh, the Glassman. So done so far is uh, made sure that we can measure the weight, the dead weight of these masses that the, the uh, one that's hanging from the ceiling, as well as the smaller one. And we can charge them up to uh, a, uh, a particular voltage. We've been able to go up to just about uh, 200 kV uh, to make sure that uh, everything is, is calibrated. And so uh, we will be forging ahead with the experiment uh, at, uh, at the appropriate time, I guess. You know, Lance can uh, uh, can describe what the appropriate time is, uh, which will be, I hope, uh, I hope soon. So that is a, a, a brief walkthrough of uh, the high voltage end of the lab, uh, which uh, I hope will give you an idea of uh, the kind of scales that uh, we're working with. Uh, and I can stop now and. Uh, and uh, take any questions with regard to the uh, experimental procedure, if you wish. George, a question on your lab facilities. What's the square footage? Your Toronto? Uh, 11,000 11, square feet. Wow, okay, thank you very much. It's large. So we can see, so I can send this thing that I'm about to show. There, I'll just that. Okay. So, um, hey, uh, can you hear us? So, one of the things that uh, we were interested in about uh, Pakhtunov stuff, and maybe you can answer, he's got a picture here of a basic impulse generator. This is a uh, two megavolt Marks Bank. So, when Pakhtunov's uh, experiments were being ran, they used quite a bit of discharge energy into that superconductor, and it was a layered superconductor as well, which was quite important. There's a boundary between those two layers. But we were wondering, have you tested it with very high impulse currents, other than just the uh, static charge stored between two spheres, for example? Uh, no, we didn't, because uh, uh, but Kletnov has 
had claimed that he got similar results with Van de Graaff machines and it just required the charge. Um, the CPC, that is quite a claim. Have you uh, heard of uh, Poor? Is that how you say it? Poor with his uh, pulse discharge uh, superconductor experiments in a uh, small vat? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, Chantel or Amy are going to discuss that. I, if we want to do that, maybe we should do that offline oh, yeah, uh, or on a, on a general discussion um, because those are ex experiments I can certainly discuss. Uh, but uh, I think in the interest of time, it might be useful to uh, continue with with uh, the uh, general yeah. theme here. You. Thanks, yeah, we'll, we'll have a chance to chat about that. I'll let you get back to it, thanks. And by the way, fantastic laboratory, quite amazing. Um, so, yeah, so uh, th this is Amy, I'll interject. I've got some funny stories about Poer and um, those uh, podlet knob style discs and I won't, I won't um, do a tangent here, but I can talk about them later if you want. Um, uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, my dad Richard Eskridge there did some um, pretty extensive collaboration with Poer back in, I don't know, it was like 2014. And they got some really inter interesting, interesting results. And we have some videos of the equipment like basically exploding with like the impulse that was coming off of those discs. It was pretty cool. But we can, we can discuss that further later. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there any further questions with regard to Lance's uh, experiment? Or Georgia, Lance, just let me, yeah, just let me thank you uh, for that summary and the walkthrough. That really looked great. And I'm glad you emphasized the vertical nature. And I would just say that I, I looked at the Townsend Brown stuff a lot uh, and tried to find indication. And, and the big thing was everything was horizontal that they were testing. And so I thought, Maybe if we just rotate to the vertical, it's all going to open up. Uh, that was part of the reasoning. But I, I appreciate you uh, summarizing that, George, and showing us your lab and, you know, proving that you're definitely the man to do this. So thank you. Hey, uh, Lance and George, can you hear me? Um, yeah, so really cool. Um, and, you know, I do comms in the other part of my job. and. I'm hoping that you have the time to flesh out that that wave equation a little bit because I'm I'm really curious to see what would happen in the uh, sort of the non steady state case because uh, I think there might be some interesting stuff there maybe relating to that Kletnov stuff as well. Okay. Um, by the way, with regard to I'll just interject uh, go the opposite of what I'm saying. Uh, I wrote a paper on uh, the Podkletnov uh, sp spinning disk experiment in Physica C back in 1999 or something like that. So if anyone's interested in um, a, f well, first tier, I consider uh, experimental uh, examination of Podkletnov spinning disk experiment, I can send you the reference. Um, so now back to, uh, back to Jim uh. and Hal. By the way, um, I do have your report, George. It's just that I can't open it for some reason. My stupid computer refuses to open the Word doc. I wonder okay. if Jim has it. Maybe they could open it and share the screen with us. Yeah, I'd, if, if you can, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be walking through it anyway in the same way that I have uh, through the lab. So, Sorry, Al. I do not have uh, George's final report. I just have his preliminary. No, I'll send it to you, Paul, because I can't open it. The stupid machine won't do it. It's the school system. They've got some weird 360 word thing going on. It's ancient. It's that it won't open the new stuff. I'll just, I'll just mail it to you, Joe, uh, Paul. Okay, um, and and I'll be uh, yakking away here and arm waving and pointing out stuff. And during that time, it might actually come uh, materialize. Uh, so now we go from the large scale down to the very small scale and uh, we're now in the process or I, I, I pro I'm going to describe um, measuring forces in the uh, in the micronewton range and this was uh, as a result of uh, Jose Radal who think I think is on this yeah um, somewhere down there uh, re-examining the basis on which uh, 
um, Hal and, and Jim were using their calibrator, uh, which you saw in, uh, in detail, in some detail anyway, um, in their presentation. And uh, this was the three coil arrangement. In fact, uh, I can uh, show you a, a vertical version of the three coil device. I don't know whether it's possible to see, but right there, is that visible? There are three, three coils. In this case, they're mounted in a vertical direction. So what was the requirement? It appeared that uh, there was a discrepancy between Jose's calculations and uh, what, um, what was being assumed by uh, uh, Hal and Jim as a calibration factor. Uh, this led to uh, some concern uh, that uh, perhaps it would be beneficial to have an independent check on the, the calibration. Uh, so uh, I was asked to uh, put our uh, uh, apparatus at, uh, at, to work. Um, and we have uh, balances that are down to the uh, um, 10, well, a couple of balances down to 10 micrograms. Uh, three of them actually, and then uh, they, a uh, very uh, a, uh, an ultra micro balance as well. That yellow thing that just appeared on the screen and then disappeared. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the reason that I had these uh, balances, Sartorius and Mettler and things, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, was because uh, uh, I had put together one of the three, I guess, uh, prominent uh, test balances uh, to look at Jim's ideas. And uh, here's a picture of the, ba of, uh, the uh, vacuum balance that I built uh, that has the, uh, all the balance guts in uh, a vacuum chamber. I don't know how much of that you can see because I don't see the screen, but there's a complicated bunch of stuff in there. And uh, I claim that uh, uh, with that apparatus, I'm able to look at sub micronewton thrusts in a horizontal direction. Well, um, in order to calibrate that balance, I needed calibrated balances which unfortunately happen to work in the vertical direction. There are a couple of sartorius balances to 10 micrograms, or actually 20 operational. And uh, I'll show you another one, uh, which, uh, which is uh, down to that range too. So um, I figured that with those devices, um, I could maybe make a contribution to um, to uh, ensuring that uh, uh, that Jose's calculations, which are based, or his recalculations based on Babbage uh, et al., which uh, uh, which Hal presented earlier, the paper of, uh, were reasonable, and I could not find any um, any uh, uh, publications that showed an experimental proof of Babbage's calculations. So uh, it, which was unfortunate because uh, those calculations seem to be uh, uh, applicable to a reasonably wide range of, um, of magnetic systems, of magnetic force systems. So uh, I took, uh, I suggested that maybe I could uh, put together a test um, to confirm or deny uh, the validity of the Babbage equations. And uh, that picture I just showed you of those uh, three, uh, Jim's three uh, coil arrangement uh, was hanging under one of the balances. Uh, and uh, I wrote a report on uh, the results of that, the summary of which uh, Hal put up uh, the, those curves that you saw 
uh, and uh, at the beginning of uh, of Hal's uh, uh, report this morning, I say this. I guess this, this morning it is early afternoon my time. Um, showed a reasonably close correspondence between the results that we got down to the uh, microgram uh, range and uh, the calculations of, uh, of Babbage. So that was uh, that was uh, happy making. But it also showed that uh, there was this discrepancy, which Hal had uh, mentioned of a factor of four or so um, that uh, needed to be uh, accommodated in uh, in future uh, reports of the of the the thrusts from uh, from Jim's uh, thrust stand. In addition, um, Martin Timar had been doing experiments. Um, with some of Jim's, or a device of Jim's, and had uh, claimed that uh, the thrusts that he was seeing from Jim's device were much smaller than what Jim was claiming. And so there was also was a question about, well, is his calibration okay? Uh, is Martin's calibration uh, acceptable? So it was also determined that I would, uh, or suggested, and I agreed uh, that uh, I would examine uh, Martin's uh, calibration procedure and his calibrator is this and I will endeavor to I hope everyone's not getting too dizzy uh, me moving around here but Martin's Martin's calibrator is a commercial device from a company called Mo Moticont and it consists of a air core coil of wire. You can see the scale here we're looking at, and a little cup that has a magnet in it, a permanent magnet. And this, uh, the coil fits into this very small annular space between the uh, magnet and the cup. So there was a question about, well, gee, maybe uh, Martin's device, or his test, you know, he was scraping against the side with this coil, or maybe there was something else going on that uh, threw his calibration off. Um, and so I was asked to put together an experimental procedure where it was, it was I, I was able to fix the exact position of this uh, coil right in the center of that annular space. But as you, you can imagine that if you just suspended this from the bottom of a balance, you know, it'd be moving around like this and it might bang up against the sides of, of this thing and cause, as it did, um, uh, some uh, uh, spurious results. So, uh, I devised a method whereby it was possible to completely fix a vertical or a virtually vertical movement of this coil in that that uh, space. Um, and I did it by remembering that um, there are there's a whole history of microengineering, you might say, based on um, called pin and cup pivot bearings. So take a uh, tiny bit, a, a little chunk of sapphire, for instance, laser drill a little V-shape in it, and then put a hardened steel or other material pin in it, and you've got a wonderful pivoting capability. For instance, as used in, remember these things? These are called moving coil meters for you youngsters. And you can see that wonderful, and that, this is a spring loaded device, but boy, is it a wonderful piece of engineering. What's inside there is something called the Tarsonval meter movement, which is a coil wrapped around a uh, piece of um, high permeability material in a magnetic field and 
it looks somewhat like this. If I can show you two of these devices, let me see. Um, so, here is the guts of one of those meter movements. Here's a second one, just happened to be side by side. But they are so delicate that hardly any force is required to move them and in a constrained motion. So what that meant was that I could mount the one of the coils of that of Martin's device on the end of one of these uh, Darsonval move, movements. Here it is sitting here. And since the movement is very slight, uh, I can get a virtually linear movement uh, up and down of the coil, but the coil stays exactly in position because it's fixed by the movement of the meter, the meter movement. So that is one of the ways that uh, I was able to ensure that uh, the multi quant coil was able to be fixed within that uh, cup. And I did the measurements and at uh, some point uh, we can, if we get that uh, uh, report up, I sent a report to, uh, to Jim. I've got the report and, and I, can, uh, I can share the screen with you. Okay. Um, but before actually, well, if people are interested, maybe we can go into that afterwards. I did want to make one point though, um, that uh, it, it, it really is unfortunate, isn't it, that gravity works this way. It would be great since we're using force balances, thrust balances that happen to like to work this way, that we could have some kind of gravitating body or something way over here, or we could tilt our, our whole thrust uh, balance uh, 90 degrees and use gravity as that wonderful constant, well, relatively depending on how much Lance is going to tell us later, um, uh, to be a constant force in a particular direction. We can't. So wouldn't it be nice if we were able to hang calibrated weights that have force directions this way, but translate into force directions this way. Well, here's a possibility. These damn things are so sensitive, these meter movements, and, and I've done it just with this movement today, I can make this thing move with, what was it, three, uh, three micronewtons of force. So if I put three micronewtons down on this side, I can move this top, these are balsa wood pieces, three micronewtons that way, you might say. So one of my thoughts is that perhaps I will try to install this thing, not with all this stuff, in my balance and add very small weights to this side and see whether I get a good calibration factor on, my, uh, on that balance I just showed you. Anyway, it was sort of a, uh, a new possibility. Just to uh, also to give you some idea of the forces that uh, are, we're dealing with if in turn, when, we're, when Jim says, you know, uh, 10 micronewtons or uh, five micronewtons, or in our case, you know, a couple of um, hundred micro, uh, um, nanonewtons, you know, what does that mean? Um, in terms of uh, objects that we have, well, one of the uh, calibrators uh, that, uh, or the calibration weights that I've had to use in calibration uh, comes from uh, Mettler, and it is a calibration weight 
that is 0.05, I don't know if you can see this, 0 0.05 milligrams. That's 50 micrograms. And I got to be very careful opening it because if I blow on it, it will, it could disappear. And what I mean by that is it is a piece of aluminum, uh, a couple of microns, of an aluminum wire, a couple of microns in diameter, and about half a uh, centimeter long, bent into a V shape. And I don't think you'll be able to see it, but it hangs on a, it has to hang on a particular piece of uh, a hanger in this cup. Uh, it's, I mean, it's really hard to see uh, in there. And it is electrostatically charged. So uh, you got to handle it with tongs and be very, very gentle with it. It's the, the smallest uh, calibration weight you can, can buy, uh, but with it at uh, 50 micrograms, um, I can calibrate our uh, various systems here uh, to ensure that uh, when I say there's a particular uh, uh, calibration standard, I, I have, I can trace it back to uh, uh, a standard. So that kind of gives you uh, maybe a, a visual representation, even though I had to do it with fingers and stuff, of the kind of forces that we're dealing with. Just a little breath and away goes your calibration weight and 400 bucks goes down the drain. So anyway, with that, I will uh, close it up. I think I'm just about... Oh, you've got another 15 minutes or, oh. or 10 minutes if you want me to bring up the, uh, the report now, because I have it uh, ready to go. Okay, well, perhaps uh, um, it might be instructive for folk to uh, take a look at that. If you want to bring it up, I will exit the lab. Yeah, um, in this report, what I tried to do, thank you very much for uh, bringing this up, uh, was to uh, ensure that the kinds of tests that uh, I was being asked to do, uh, I could uh, justify and that uh, I could take account of the kinds of spurious uh, um, artifactual forces um, that uh, plague these kinds of measurements. Uh, at the large scale, the forces um, are of electrostatics and, and image charges and all sorts of other stuff are, uh, are large, but so are the expected forces. In this case, uh, in the case of this particular experiment um, that you're looking at now, the forces are really small and so uh, other precautions have to be uh, taken. For instance, in this picture, um, you see a, a Mettler um, 10 microgram uh, uh, balance, uh, which has a, 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 hang, a hang down, Oop, there, there it is. And underneath it, uh, it's, it's mounted on a, uh, a granite uh, a machinist table uh, for anti-seismic uh, concerns. Uh, there is a shield uh, which is you can barely see around the actual test apparatus, uh, the test which is going on underneath. Uh, so that uh, tends to uh, minimize uh, air currents, which will definitely mess up the, uh, the uh, measurements. And uh, the, um, in, in the case of Jim's uh, calibrator, uh, calibration coils, the coils have to be positioned uh, exactly in case they are being compared to the Babbage equations exactly the, the movable coil which is the, the middle one has to be positioned exactly halfway between the outer ones. So I have uh, put together a, uh, uh, a translation of a, a micro stage, uh, a couple of stages uh, an op from an optical uh, experiment so that we can move the uh, those coils into exact position uh, that is uh, representative of what uh, Babbage uh, equations uh, are meant to, to
to show. Um, there's an example of the, uh, uh, of the stage. Uh, in addition, uh, we need to get power or current to the middle coil, which is the movable coil. So how does one do that uh, without going into uh, the case of um, using, let's say, gallium or uh, some other liquid metal? Uh, even if we did use liquid metal at these, uh, at these um, uh, small, uh, small currents, uh, that I'm trying to get down to, the, the, the liquid metal would mess up. Uh, it has its own forces. Uh, there's adhesion, there's, um, there's uh, tensile for, there's, there's all sorts of different forces that would mess things up. So I, I found that using very small diameter wire, um, I could uh, find a, a sweet spot or a sweet position of the wire that leads from the lab frame to that middle coil uh, with uh, number, was it number 44 wire, still be able to produce the kind of current or allow the kind of current to flow that would give me micrograms uh, or sorry, micronewtons of, of force uh, and not overheat the wire too much. So uh, that is sort of a, a, an, a an overview of a, a couple of concerns. Um, also, you can see in this particular picture, um, Babbage assumed, of course, theoretically, that the coils, the three coils were completely uh, uh, concentric. And in order to do that, you, that's why the stage in the back moves horizontally as well as vertically. Um, I could position the, the coils so that they, according to that angle you see, um, standing, uh, sitting there, are as close to perfectly uh, uh, coaxial as possible. So um, it, it, that was uh, part of the um, uh, of the setup for uh, recalibrating Jim's um, calibrator based on uh, the uh, uh, the Babbage equations. So if you s scroll down a little bit more, uh, we'll get to uh, Martin's. So there's, there's Martin's uh, coil, which I showed just a moment ago. Um, he suspended it in, in one case from a beam, which you can just see across the top. And he suspended the coil and the cup holding the magnet is on the uh, pan of one of the, uh, the balances. Uh, this is a, 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 one of the ways I uh, calibrated it. Uh, but of course, since this is a magnetic system, I have to be careful of spray, stray magnetic fields messing up the balance. So there's a plate of mu metal underneath. You can see that square plate. And there's a draft shield and a whole bunch of other stuff, which uh, is in the report. If you can go down a little bit more, um, let's see if there's that, oh, that picture of the little, I think it's down further. Um, that's the final result. Let's see. Um, I guess it's it's the, the picture's up a little farther. Um, it's it's a picture of or a photo of of the um, the ability you might say of these Darsonval oop that you just I think passed it Darsonval meter movements to keep a just keep going down the. Um, Thing, uh, the uh, coil in exactly the right position in the uh, Dresden situation. So anyway, uh, I guess uh, it's flying by here. The net result is that uh, w I was able to uh, uh, confirm that uh, Martin's uh, Dresden uh, calibration was uh, good and I was able to confirm that the, uh, the Babbage equations were uh, applicable to actual uh, physical uh, uh, apparatus uh, and, and, uh, and measurement, uh, which uh, leads me to believe that um, at least Martin uh, has a correct calibration uh, when he sees, when he measures uh, thrusts on one of his balances, and that uh, 
um, Hal and Jim can rely on the Babbage, um, the, the Babbage equations to uh, calibrate their calibrator. So, uh, and I don't know whether that in report is universally available, but uh, I have to leave that up to uh, to Mike and uh, uh, and and, and Nyack to uh, determine. Anyway, that that uh, is about all for me. Well, that brings us up to the five minute mark. So that was pretty much perfect. Thanks, George. Uh, are there any questions for George? I can stop sharing the screen. Um, yes, George. Uh, I'm Mark from Falcon Space. Uh, have you read this paper by uh, Doyle Bueller? Um, and it's called. Oh, uh, you can't see it, can you? It's exploratory, called exploratory yep. research on the phenomena of the motion, or excuse me, of the movement of high voltage capacitors. So there, there it is again. Yes, I believe I have. Um, in there, it actually states that the. Um, experiment did not work while it was in a Faraday cage with the parallel plate capacitors. Have you tried, um, is your building made out of uh, um, a metal? Uh, the building is uh, partly concrete. It's a, uh, mostly concrete, uh, concrete walls and it has a steel roof. So if the steel roof is grounded, you might be inside of a Faraday cage and it wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't expect any effects according to this paper. Uh, that's, that may be the case. Um, I have my doubts, but uh, when I did the original experiment uh, on the uh, uh, Townsend Brown uh, experiment, uh, it was parallel plates in oil. Right. So, we've we've tried. We've both tried this experiment independently. Yeah, extensively. We've actually got a research group that also has tried this experiment uh, three other times to replicate it, and none of us have received any results except for one who used very thin wires, which we are certain were leaking a very large amount of ionic current. Yeah, I, I haven't ever uh, found any uh, positive results, you might say, from a, a Biefeld-Brown effect. Same here, we've tested over seven different configurations and never received anything from any of them. Uh, we yeah. did find a lot of ways to make mistakes and think you're getting something though. I bet you. The false positives and the calibration problems become a real issue when uh, measuring around electrostatics just because the field geometries will create anomalous forces that have to be accounted for. That's right. Yeah, right, well, all, thank you very much. all of these effects tend to have um, a lot of noise that you have to control for. And there's also usually um, very specific configurations that you need um, that are not exactly obvious. Um, that you're not necessarily going to stumble upon and, and specific um, uh, the factors that have to be happening. Like, like with the rotating superconductor disc thing for Podletkinov, he only saw his effect during deceleration through a specific range of RPM. That, okay. So there's always weird little things like that that you have to get just right or you're not going to see anything. Is that Amy? Yes, I'm sorry, this is Amy. Uh, Joe Blood, that's what it says on the screen. <laughs> Well, that's my pseudonym oh, for okay. my computer. Um, all, all my right. devices have different pseudonyms. Hold on, let me see if I can put my name in here. Yeah, my name's not Joe. <laughs> I didn't think so. You might yeah. be. Those, those who are interested in uh, the, the problems of force measurements, um, at, at very small force measurements may be interested in uh, a presentation I gave at the Tennessee Valley interstellar workshop a number of years ago where I uh, highlighted, and I, I did the same, essentially same presentation that uh, um, at this, uh, at the Estes Park workshop, um, it's the last year or two years ago, I guess, uh, highlighting uh, a great number of potential pitfalls that uh, you can uh, stumble into when measuring small forces. So that might be of benefit if you ask Hal for that, uh, a reference to that, that paper of mine in, uh, in the proceedings. It's on the SSI website. You can download it for free. It was 2016. So it's a SS part conference proceedings, uh, 2016 on the SSI.org website. So any further questions?
No? Well, thank you very much, George. That was very instructive. I really look, enjoyed the uh, tour around your lab. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank um, you. We can now break for lunch and uh, we'll be back at 1.30 and Jim will kick off again and, and tell you about all the very recent stuff with the Mac FX, uh, the Mega Drive and uh, the, the recent sliders and that sort of thing.